As I was looking at the new Abraham Accord coin that's been minted, where it shows the Islamic scimitar sword being disintegrated in the upper half, and it is speaking of that they will turn their swords into plowshares. I just wanted to share a little bit about plowshares and something that the Lord showed me about this. So here is the Abraham Accord coin, the front and the reverse. The front of the coin actually has the flag of Israel, the flag of the UAE, and then on from the middle to the left is Jerusalem along with the Western Wall, David's Citadel, I can see the, the um, windmill f from the Holland part of Jerusalem, and then on the right is Abu Dhabi with the tall tower that tries to reach unto God. And then, of course, it's got the eagle for America. Now you can see it says Donald J. Trump underneath the scimitar sword, and it's a quote from the Quran on the left-hand side, which says, And if one inclines towards peace, it inclines towards you. And also the Hebrew scripture um, you know, on the sword, it's showing technology, science. You know, it shows the satellite dish, heart medicine, shows a syringe with medicine, shows the wheels of technology, shows numbers of mathematician, and of course the palm tree, the symbol of Saudi Arabia on their flag. And the satellite, the rocket, the dove of peace, and then at the top is Jupiter, which actually Jupiter was another name for the abomination of desolation. So this new Abraham Accord coin is depicting the Arabian sword called the scimitar. And the biblical term swords into plowshares when it speaks about that they will basically lay down their weapons and turn them into plowshares. It actually is a concept in which military weapons or technologies are converted for peaceful civilian applications. And that, of course, is the statue that they had at the UN and showing them hammering their Islamic swords into plowshares. And this is the statue. It's the UN has this statue, and he's beating his sword into a plow blade. And this statue was called, Let Us Beat Our Swords Into Plowshares. And it was a gift from Russia in 1959 to the United Nations. So now this is what they are doing with the Arabian sword of Islam. He is showing that on the coin that they're turning the sword of Islam into technology, science, medicine, and the like. The scripture regarding this is in Isaiah. It says, Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. 
They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore, which is Isaiah 2, 3 through 4. And, of course, plowshares um, is also translated in Hebrew as coulter, is often used to symbolize creative tools that benefit humankind as opposed to destructive tools of war symbolized by the sword. In Hebrew, hereb, a similar sharp metal tool with an arguably opposite use. So, of course, the Abraham Accord coin, the reverse, shows on the top half of what was the Islamic sword, shows technology, science, medicine, satellite technology, the Dove of Peace, and Jupiter, which Jupiter also has another meaning, which was the abomination of desolation in actuality. I know there's people that say that Jupiter is the king planet and that it represents Jesus, but I really do not believe that because it was the abomination of desolation, another name for the mythical abomination of desolation, which was Zeus. And I hate saying that name, but he had another name, Jupiter, and so they made these statues of Zeus, which was Jupiter, and they put them and desecrated the holy temple in Jerusalem with it back in the days of the Maccabees. So on the reverse Abraham Accord coin, at the very top, right after you have the dove of peace with the olive leaf in her mouth, you have the planet Jupiter right at the top, which I find interesting because a lot of people don't know that that is a connection to the abomination of desolation that happened in Solomon's temple. And also, statues of Jupiter were placed in Jerusalem when the Romans were there as well. What's interesting is that as I began to think about the plow blade and the sword being hammered into a plow blade. You know, you could look at that two ways, that it's just a farming tool, an implement, but what really struck me that the Lord showed me was that the plow blade is actually groundbreaking. So this idea that they are turning the Islamic sword of war through technology and science and math and outer space and all of that is really bringing all these Islamic countries together under this Abraham Accord is something that they really consider something that's groundbreaking. And I thought that that was kind of neat that the Lord showed me that. I just thought I'd share that with you. Now, when I said that the plow blade is groundbreaking, I mean that hard compacted soil is broken up when you run the plow blade through it. It mixes organic matter deep into the soil and any weeds that are there are plowed under and basically destroyed so that they can't compete with the good crop that's coming up. And you might be able to figure out what I'm getting at. <laughs> In other words, the plow blade disrupts the weeds from growing. And of course the farmers plow so that they can plant the good crop. Usually the seeds are planted about an inch under the soil so the good crop will come up and prosper 
while the weeds that come up and choke out that crop are destroyed by the early plowing with the plow blade to prevent the weeds from choking out good crop. And when you plow, you're plowing all of that rich soil so that it loosens it so that you can get a good crop to grow so that you'll have a good harvest in the end. So the Abraham Accord coin that depicts the Islamic scimitar sword of Islam that has been used for centuries in war, they are now hoping to beat into plowshares. Now we was just reading that Saudi Arabia, they're turning over their flour mills to third party people to control their flour mills, which flour is made from wheat, which I find very interesting because that leads me to the parable of the sower. And you can find the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, 1 through 9, Luke 8, 4 through 15. And I'm in Matthew 13, starting in chapter 1, and I'll just read this. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. Now, part of the plow blade use is to deeply get deep in the soil to, to have a groundbreaking situation where all the clay and the hardness of the soil is busted up and mixing in the manure and the good rich soil so that you can plant and the roots will go down deeply because you've broken up all of that deep soil that's been compacted and is too hard for a seed to take root. So when Jesus is talking about they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth, he's basically saying the ground wasn't plowed. You know, it was just surface. So it didn't take deep in the soil with the roots. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Well, that's been going on for centuries. The Christians and Jewish people being choked out because of the sword of Islam. But other fell onto good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And you know, these are the people that are saying peace and security as one of the names of the Islamic crescent moon god. They're saying it daily in their prayers as they go over their prayer beads. This is something that the Lord revealed to me that I shared with you. And, you know, they do not have these secret mysteries, but it's been given to Jesus disciples who then gave it to us through their writings and you know he says that sudden destruction will come upon them and they shall not escape and in this Jesus is saying but to them it is not given these mysteries 
of the Messiah are not given to those who do not follow him and do not know him. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing not and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And interestingly, Jesus quotes Isaiah right here, and that is where that scripture of the plowshares is, is in Isaiah. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. Now Israel is making the Abraham accord with these people. And after Jesus quotes Isaiah, he says, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. In other words, they're not going to know the mystery of the parable of the sower, the good soil, and the weeds are coming up alongside the good crop, but they're not understanding because they're not accepting their king, the Messiah. And he goes on to say, if they did listen and they did hear, they would understand and he would heal them. All you have to do is accept your Messiah and these things would be gone. So if you turn and listen to King Messiah Yeshua, he will heal you. And then the Messiah goes on saying, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them, because they refused the Messiah, they refused to hear what he had to say to them, which gave them the mysteries of God. So then Yeshua goes on to say, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, ground that's not been plowed, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by, he is offended. So unless the ground is properly plowed, allowing the good earth to be have the ground broken up, and of course the Abraham Accord is being said that it's groundbreaking, <laughs> the Lord had shown me that, and I was just like, that's amazing, you know, and then he goes on to say that, you know, these people are offended by Jesus being the Messiah. They don't want him to be the Messiah or the King, or they try to explain away everything that he has fulfilled, and they don't understand that we're still in the history of the world where he's fulfilling things, and some of these fulfillments are coming in the future. And Yeshua says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, 
some 60, some 30. So he's basically saying, you know, if the ground is broken up and plowed properly, the good crop will come up. But an enemy has sown tares into his field. And so right after the parable of the sower, of course, is the parable of the weeds. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So interestingly, you have these Islamic nations coming together in an accord with Israel. And of course, that is the Lord's field where he planted the good seed. And this is where the tares are coming up along with God's crop. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed on thy field? From whence hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then the Lord gives the parable of the mustard seed and the short parable of the leaven. In verse 34 says, All these things spake Jesus, unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now this reminds me of Matthew 24, and if you go to Matthew 24, First, Jesus foretells that the temple will be destroyed, and then he speaks about false messiahs that are coming. He speaks to them about that his word will be witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And then he ironically talks about the abomination of desolation, in which I just mentioned the abomination of desolation that was put in the holy temple was Zeus during the days of the Maccabees who's also called Jupiter and on the Abraham Accord at the top of the coin is the planet Jupiter which represents that abomination of desolation in uh, an indirect sort of way so when you get to Matthew 24 and he's talking about the abomination of desolation he says these words and I'm starting in Matthew 24 verse 15 when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand in other words this has been seen before in history and it's going to be seen again in history and when you see it you'll understand it and you'll know that the end is at hand then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. And of course, the accord is dealing with all the territory in Judea and Samaria. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight may not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now you know when he says, let him which is in the field not return back home to take his clothes. That's very interesting because 
during the time, you know, leading up to Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, the saying, the king is in the field, is very prevalent in the Jewish community. The king is in the field. That means God himself is in the field. And he says, you know, if you're in the field, don't return home to get your clothes, but be prepared to flee. And he says, but pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Messiah, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch, that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. And then when he talks about the return of the Son of Man, the return of the Messiah, Jesus Christ Nazareth, from heaven to earth, this is the second coming of Jesus. He says these words, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. And to me, the desert represents Mount Sinai in Arabia. If they're telling you that the Messiah is in Arabia on Mount Sinai, or they show him in that location, believe it not, Yeshua says. And go not forth to see. If they say, Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So in other words, there are a lot of secret chambers in the Holy Temple. When they build the third temple, you're not to believe that he is in the Holy of Holies or that he's in the secret chambers because he's coming like lightning flashing from the east to the west and he's going to come in the clouds because he's coming back down from heaven where he ascended up. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So at the second coming, you know, you're going to have the Lord intervene in the battle of Armageddon, and all of these birds of the air are going to feed on the carcasses of the enemies that do not believe that God is their Messiah in Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth. And so they're going through the time of Jacob's trouble because they have ears to hear but they're not hearing. They have eyes to see but they do not see and so they don't understand that there's a full picture of what's going on and the Lord is going to gather up his crop and take his good crop into his barn which is his heavenly temple so you know you had the parable of the sower the good soil the good crop and you had the tares mixed in and he said to wait until the harvest when the weeds would be gathered in bundles and burned. When the weeds would be gathered in bundles and burned, but that he would gather his wheat crop into his barn. So then he goes on to say, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and he's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the last seven years, the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. And of course, Daniel and those who were thrown in the fiery furnace, they were all princes of Judah. Not too many people realize that that was the royalty of Israel. And interestingly, they were in Babylon where all these false gods were worshiped and Nebuchadnezzar was trying to make them fall down and worship 
you know, these false gods, which you had the beast there with the mark on the middle of the forehead, which was the crescent moon god, Sin. And then you have this last seven years fulfillment of what Daniel prophesied. And so you had the Lord struck Nebuchadnezzar because he was not believing in the one true God that Daniel and Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael, who were thrown into the fiery fur furnace, he was not believing in their God. He was believing in all the crescent moon god sin and all these other pagan gods. And so what did God do? But he made him basically crawl on the ground till he recognized the one true God. And Nebuchadnezzar was basically turned in sort of like an animal-like character for seven years until he came to the conclusion that Daniel's God was the one true living God of the universe. And the Savior, the one in the fiery furnace that was like the Son of God, was the Messiah, Yeshua. So until Nebuchadnezzar recognizes the one true God of Israel and the Savior, Messiah, that was in not only the lion's den saving Daniel from the lions and he's the lion of the tribe of Judah and here he is in the midst of the flames and they are not burned nor is one hair of their head singed nor did their clothes have the smell of smoke on them okay so until Nebuchadnezzar recognizes this after seven years of him going through a sort of mini tribulation of his own making then he was restored back to normal after he recognized the one true God, the Savior is Yeshua. The Savior, which means Yeshua, means salvation. So the time of Jacob's trouble is Israel going through this situation for seven years until they recognize their king, until they come to the end of the time of mourning for their Messiah since the time he was cut off. And so he goes on to say, immediately after the tribulation of those days, that's the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven years till they acknowledge Yeshua is their king. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Now the great trump is blown at Yom Kippur. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And the, there's a prophecy that says, you know, that at the time of the end, you know, when the Messiah actually comes and gathers his people together, Every man will sit under his vine and under his fig tree. And of course, this is what Nathaniel realized that Yeshua was revealing to him when he said to him, he said, you are Nathaniel. And he said, how did you know my name? And he said, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. So at the time of the coming of the Messiah in the last days, he saw the end and he recognized his Messiah right then and there because 
Jesus told him, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree. That is a future event. And after, after these things happen, then you have the lesson of the fig tree. Now some of these things I'm telling you are things that the Lord revealed to me that are written in my book. So that's when he talks about the parable of the fig tree is right after he tells all about the sun, moon, and stars, you know, all of the destruction that's going on in the universe. And he's saying, now learn a parable of the fig tree because when the Messiah comes, every man will sit under his vine and under his fig tree when the Lord gathers his people together and all Israel will be saved is what it says in Romans. So when he talks about the parable of the fig tree after this horrible time of the tribulation, he says, um, now learn a parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And after he says heaven and earth shall pass away, he says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. He's saying, when heaven and earth shall pass away, no one knows the day or hour of that. Okay? But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall to be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken and the other left. And you know, incidentally, the Lord was showing me a comparison of that in the wilderness of Sinai because they had the women grinding at the mill when they had the manna. And they were grinding it into flour and, you know, they were in the field of the wilderness at the time. So they were grinding the manna in the wilderness. And these women were grinding at the mill. They were turning this into flour. And so you have the true manna coming down from heaven at that time. And, you know... One will be taken, one will be left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? And the meat is the true manna from heaven. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so if you keep going, you know, the, the verses and chapters were added later, so, if you keep going, you get next to the parable of the ten virgins. 
And the Lord showed me something about this that I have written in my book, an interpretation of this that has never been known before. How things have been interpreted in the past, it was interpreted that way because there was no other very good explanation or people tried to reason as to what they thought this meant. But the Lord showed me something very different about the parable of the virgins. And so I'm going to share it with you. It is now being revealed, I think, for such time that we're living in right now. And considering what's happening with the Abraham Accord, and because the Muslim nations are making an accord with Israel, this even further verifies the interpretation that the Lord had shown me that I wrote in my book. And so here is what the Lord had shown me. Let me finish reading this here. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those wise virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And then he goes on with the parable of the talents. So the interpretation that the Lord gave me is this. The five wise virgins, they had the Torah. They had the Word of God, the Holy Spirit oil in their lamps. The five foolish virgins had the five pillars of Islam. So you have the five books of the Torah, which are the five wise virgins, the five pillars of Islam, which were those who were unwise. Now, they didn't have the oil in their lamps because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have the living Torah. And so those who were wise went in and those who were not wise that didn't have the oil but went to their merchants to try to get it couldn't get it and so they didn't go in with the bridegroom and when they're knocking on the door saying let us in he's saying depart from me I never knew you now before I show you how that interpretation coincides with the interpretation in Matthew 7 I want to talk about how there is exorcism in Islam and it's Azaim and Rukya on the other hand summons jinn and demons by invoking the names of God and to command them to abandon their mischiefs and is thought to repair damage believed caused by jinn possession witchcraft or the evil eye now they also believe that Muhammad prophesied and has prophecies that are in the Quran. So now I'm going to share with you, based on what I'm just sharing with you, the interpretation of Matthew 7 that 
corresponds with the interpretation of the parable of the virgins in the interpretation the way that the Lord showed me right there with the five pillars of Islam and the five books of the Torah that have the Holy Spirit of God in them. And they think this is God. But it isn't God, it's Satan, because Satan is the greatest deceiver. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And so, when he spoke about the wheat and the tares, and the tares coming up, with the good fruit he said you know that they would bind them in bundles and that they would be burned in the fire and that's what he's saying here as well and so now with showing you that interpretation here we go this is the interpretation the Lord showed me in Matthew 7 not everyone that saith unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so the interpretation the Lord showed me was this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And the Muslims are always saying in the name of, and they're prophesying through Muhammad. They're using his prophecies in the Quran. So they're calling in thy name and they're calling him Allah and he isn't Allah okay and they're saying have we not prophesied in thy name and in so Muhammad was in the name of Allah and prophesied that way and in thy name cast out jinns devils demons and they think that they have all these wonderful charities, these wonderful works that they do. And so when they're questioning the Lord, you know, haven't we done all these things in your name? And he says, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now when Jesus says to them, Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. And you look at the definition of iniquity, you see that it's gross injustice, wickedness, a wicked act or thing, or sin. And sin is the crescent moon god of Islam. It's also the mark that was in the forehead of the cow, the beast, in Babylon. So right there on the Abraham Accord coin, you have the sword of Islam, the scimitar, which was used for centuries to slaughter people in the name of their god, Sin. And it's now being beaten into a plowshare a plow and it's going to be mixed with Israel God's field where he planted his seeds from the beginning the promised land and all of this revelation is given to me by the Lord if the standard interpretation of those verses is Christians that are just backslidden, I don't believe the Lord would use the words, depart from me, I never knew you. Never. 
it's not like he knew them and they backslid no you know now they don't have the oil in their lamps like they should have and that's a wrong interpretation this is people that do not know who God really is or they would know he's not sin they would know he's not the greatest deceiver and that the things that they've prophesied in the name of the crescent moon God sin is not the Lord God of Israel is not the Savior Yeshua and I think these interpretations were meant for such a time as we are living in there's coming a time when the Lord is going to reap the harvest of Israel and I believe at the end of the seven years Israel's going to understand the Savior is their Joshua to take them into the promised land and that Joshua is Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth this is what God's given me to speak and so I'm saying it and speaking it to you